Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's Friday, the 17th of March. Top of the morning to everybody. Big aura, to be sure. Oh, keep it shut up. Oh, I'll put some petrol in the car, that's all right. Yeah, so what were we talking about yesterday? Oh yes, oh yes. The state of dentistry. Angry state of the nation address continues. God dear, it's not as bad as the state of the roads. What's the news? Oh, I've managed to get a... Oh no, I haven't. I need to pay for it. I've managed to get a cam belt for my rotivator. And I needed... Um, I wanted to plug an extra computer screen in to the computer at work. And uh, I needed a special lead. Digital video lead, so I went to uh, PC World. They hadn't got one, sent me to Maplin's, they hadn't got one. Actually, I rang up Maplin's and asked them if they had one. They said they had one, then I went under, they said they didn't have one. It turned out it was an adapter. So, uh, I ring up um, Amazon and, uh, well, you know, go online and find the lead I want, press a button and it's going to be here today. So, and uh, in Maplin's, the leads are £20. That's a basic lead, one of their, you know, Tesco's Essentials lead or £40 or £60 if you want it gold plated if you're a gold plated mug and you want a gold plated lead to go with your mug then you spend 60 quid on it so I would have if even if they'd had the lead I would have spent 20 quid now I probably would have spent 20 quid for convenience because I was in the shop you know and I wanted to get the second computer monitor going yesterday but this is what I was saying about people being time poor, you know. Everybody, everybody wants everything done yesterday, don't they? Preferably yesterday morning, because yesterday afternoon would be too late. So, uh, I probably would have spent 20 quid yesterday, but now, as it turns out, I've just had to be a bit patient, and I'm going to spend £5.99 or something today. So, what else has been going on? Let me have a think. No, oh, I can't remember. I was gonna. Oh, my tractor! I've uh, some spring has sprung really early, and uh, the grass has started growing like it does in May. I mean, it may get cold again. I don't know, but um, I've had to start mowing the lawn. So, and I get punctures in my tyres on my tractor. So I had to buy some tyres, Kevlar tyres. Can you believe it? But I've got bulletproof tyres on my tractor now, and they were about 400 quid a pair. It just goes to show you how much, uh, you know, I mean, money, you know, I'm not going to become one of these people that moans about the fact that money's not worth much anymore. People actually usually moan about the fact that prices have gone up. And in fact, I tend to moan about the fact that the value, the purchasing power of money has gone down. That's what it boils down to. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the fee setting uh, is coming up soon, isn't it? First of April. That's the time that I usually adjust my fees. I think I'm going to have to make some sort of adjustment to the fees. The fortunate thing about it is that you can, you know, you can adjust your private fee scale in private. So if you, you're going to put sort of 5% on it, then, uh, then um, that's a good idea. Now, why don't we do a survey of private fees in the next week or so, and then we can all work out between us what dental inflation is, because it's probably not uh, anything near retail price inflation or consumer price inflation or general, um, you know, pr you know, well, I don't know what you call it, real inflation, you know, the one, the actual inflation, which doesn't bear any resemblance to the government figures. And then you've got dental inflation, which is basically how much Dental Directory and Henry Shiner put their prices up this year. And then, and how much wages have gone up this year, you know. So, um, yeah, so I think I'll get that organised today because I don't think my first patient's going to turn up. He's one of these people who um, only came once, I think, about a problem and then didn't come back and finish his treatment and he's just got an automatic recall. So I shall use this time to stare at my blank computer. This sort of, the point about convenience is, is shouldn't be lost on us as dentists, I don't think, you know. There I was yesterday prepared to pay £20 for something that I could have got elsewhere for five if I decided to wait a day, right? 
I mean, you know, I didn't know that at the time, but I suspected that that was probably the case. We all know that is the case, don't we? And then, um, you know, today probably I'll have a patient in who wants to have something done. And while I would never, angry, would never charge a patient four times what, you know, the job was worth to do something rushed. I mean, we are actually a little bit more ethical than that, I think. We are, you know, we're not capitalist tooth and claw, are we? We do tend to say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll put 30% on or something. 30% is about the most we would probably put on for a rush job. And we would probably consider ourselves quite lucky to, to get that. Um, but, you know, we, we the fact that we can do things quickly is a, is a service in itself, you know, over and above the service that we're rendering. I'm pleased to say in, in my practice, which is all private, I have the luxury of being able to fit people in at short notice. And uh, new patients are quite surprised about this, uh, you know, when they say, oh, I've, um, you know, my crown's fallen out and I can't get in anywhere locally. Do you think, can you see me? And I say, yeah, about half past 11. And they're like, oh, uh, oh, that's, Really? Oh, okay. Because the, the you know the second best offer I got was half past May. So, it speed is a uh, speed is something, isn't it? Anyway, as far as fixing the health service goes, or as far as fixing dentistry, let's not concentrate on the health service because, I mean, I think the health service is uh, obviously a major component, but um, and it could be run run better. But I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to turn this into just like a constant knocking of the National Health Service because, as a concept, I think a sort of a safety net dental service is is an excellent idea. I have slight qualms about whether or not the public purse can be used to fund a comprehensive dental service for everybody, and um, because what a comprehensive dental service means now is not actually what it was intended to mean in 1948. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> excuse me, the first thing I'm going to say is that the, the constant whinging, the constant whinging about from people that they just need, if only they had more money, it would be fine. You know, the, the, the underfunding, oh, we are underfunded, you know, we are, more money needs to be put into this, more money needs to be put into that. that I am totally at odds with that argument. My... I would say, if anything, less money needs to be put in. And not because I'm not, you know, I, I'm saying less patients should be treated. I think we could actually treat more patients with less money. And so you say, oh, angry, how can, that's obviously a contradiction in terms. How can you justify that? You know, that's outrageous. <laughs> well, the, what, you know, you have to look, just ask yourself what happens when you put more money in. And the answer is it just gets spent people get bigger budgets there's a lot of empire building there's a lot of um, uh, waste uh, inefficiency uh, chief executives treating themselves to outrageous pay uh, upper senior management treating themselves to middle management to do their jobs for them and more pay etc etc the whole thing's just a complete a complete nose in the trough so, and they never have enough. I mean, there's ne there never will be enough money. You could double the budget for the National Health Service and they would still say, yeah, but if only we had, if we had a little bit more, uh, everything would be fine. Also, there's an incentive for under that system for people to literally to cock the system up. They'll, you know, they'll, <laughs> if a, a government department or, or, or a quango or a statutory body or a force or something, feels as though they're short of cash then what happens is they they sort of there's this sort of campaign of passive resistance whereby they start cocking stuff up <laughs> and uh, so so let's say the um, I don't know let's say the firefighters uh, uh, go or the police go to the government and say we want more money and the government says no we think you've got enough so what will happen is all of a sudden there'll be a crime wave <laughs> or a lot of, a lot of uh, things will start burning down. And then the police and the firefighters are going to say, so we told you, we told you we haven't got enough money. <laughs> so, and what does the government do? You know, and they're like, oh, you know, okay, let's compromise, you know. 
you don't let so many things burn down and we'll give you a bit more money. <laughs> it's not it's not a healthy relationship. And uh, the health service isn't a healthy relationship. The problem is we have got, there are millions and millions and millions of people in this country employed in public sector jobs that, that I will, you know, these are the people that will march, you know, they, they will make banners, they'll get up early, they'll travel to London, they'll write to their MPs if they feel that their livelihood is being threatened. And who can blame them? You know, you can't blame someone for trying to save their job. They're not actually looking at it on an impartial, unbiased point of view, are they, from a third party perspective and saying, actually, is my job doing anything? You know, is it just a, is it just a, a make work type? arrangement um, and uh, unfortunately uh, so many of them are because the, the levers the, the levers which in the private sector bring about efficiencies are do not exist in the public sector they really honestly are completely absent and so the the sort of the decisions that I have to make as a practice owner about how many staff to employ are not made by by the local commissioning authorities where I am and so as a result, they spend, for, for every sort of £10,000 I spend, they spend a million. Where they could spend 10000 And I think the difference is that in the private sector, you get to save money. If you save money, then you get to keep it. You know, it all goes to your bottom line, doesn't it? If you cut money on expenses. I mean, if you, if you increase your turnover, then... You, you get to make more money, but then you've got the associated expenses with increasing the turnover, perhaps more staff costs, more materials, more laboratory bills and stuff like that. But if you actually cut expenses, it goes, that falls straight to your bottom line. You know, if you can find a lab that does work the same quality for half the price, then you get to keep all of that saving. Um, and that's, you know, your, that, that can be quite considerable if you concentrate on and not necessarily pairing things to the bone, but just making sure that, you know, you're not spending more than you need to for, for various bits and pieces. So, in the public sector, if you um, save money, then what happens is you don't see any of it. It doesn't make the slightest bit of difference to your pay. Uh, and it all goes back to the central authority, and you're basically regarded as a failure. Because uh, you've, you know, you've let the department down. You've, <laughs> you've had your budget cut. You're on the way out. You're a loser. <laughs> so, so uh, obviously, a lot of uh, time and expense is spent trying to increase your budget, and you take on more uh, staff to work on increasing your budget to pay the more staff that you've taken on. So, <clears throat> the key, I think, to to the health service and various and, and public sector in general is what I call the shared savings approach and this is sort of most it's, it's best demonstrated in the railways I think where what happened was the government was running the railways at a loss or they, they saw it as a loss you know well let's put it they saw it obviously it's always going to be a loss but then they thought that well you know this is being run inefficiently so what they did was they decided to privatise it and uh, gave the rail franchises out to the various uh, companies. And then <clears throat> the companies then introduced private sector efficiencies and started making large profits. So the government, which was giving them the money, out of which they were then saving and keeping the profit, said, look, uh, this is getting a bit ridiculous. You know, we said we would we'd pay you X million, but... You know, we didn't realise you'd be taking, you'd be trousering so much of it, and uh, let's not get involved in a crash on live TV. Trouble with these cars is a lot of them are turning left, but the odd one isn't. So, and I don't want to pull out in front of the one, the odd one. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, where was I? So, shared savings, railways. Okay. So, <clears throat> so what the the government said to these people was look can we come to a deal whereby you know you're obviously making profits far in excess of what what either of us had anticipated so can we share the savings in other words if you make a saving so you save 100 million pounds on the budget can we split it 50 50 and we won't make a fuss if you trouser 50 as long as you 
give us 50 back because obviously you're over, you know, the budget was too much. And um, this was the system I think that existed for a long time in dentistry, certainly from 48 onwards, was that dentists, although people thought what well, dentists were employees of the National Health Service because the doctors were employees, but dentists were never employees. Dentists, I think, did something quite clever in 1948, or, or rather, the government didn't want to pay dentists because at that time dentists were extremely well paid. There was a massive, massive backlog of fillings and plastic dentures and extractions to do, and the government knew that dentists were going to be expensive, so what they did was they decided not to put them on a salary. But I think that was a big mistake because um, dentists became self employed subcontractors. Now, they chose to work wholly for the National Health Service, most of them, because it, they were on a good, uh, you know, on a good good wedge. And these were the days when dentists got their reputation that, that, and became the sort of stereotype of the high earning, where you got the, the high earning dentist, you know, you dentists, you're all rich, etc. This was the 50s and the 60s when, and the 70s to a certain extent, the 80s even, when dentists were uh, making a lot of money. But um, we were never employees, we were just self-employed subcontractors. And so what happened was we would get a, we were on a, a contract in effect. I mean, we could write our own contract because uh, we, if we did something and put in a claim for it and it was valid, then the government paid it. And so it was, to a certain extent, it was an open-ended contract. But um, the point was that we kept any profit. So if we did, if we reused the curly suckers, or if we reused the plastic beakers, then we got to take home what we'd saved. And that led to a tremendous drive for efficiency. <laughs> where, and you know, and where some dentists did reuse the curly suckers. And it was like, no, that's going too far. I mean, even the profession realized that that was going too far. And so, <clears throat> That, you know, I mean, you can argue that that's going too far the wrong way. So you do have to have a lot of, you know, you have to keep an eye on people when you're, they're making efficiencies. You have to have service level agreements, quality standards, etc. But that's certainly, that's very doable, you know. Uh, and I'd rather be, I'd rather err on the side of reusing the curly suckers than err on the side of someone losing a tooth because the, 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 the dentist doesn't feel he's got the budget to root treat it. But, um... The, the shared savings approach worked because the every April the government used to look at the budget and they used to say, look guys, you know, we budgeted X million for the dental service and you've gone over the budget. Um, so we're having some of that back and some of it we used to keep and some of it uh, we had to give back. And we moaned like mad and said that we'd done the work and we don't see why we should have to give it back. But, but we did, you know, there was this sort of, it worked quite well for both sides because the government was able to give us the, an, a blank checkbook and, um, but still have a budget which, which could be defined post facto, after the event. They didn't even have to say, that, look guys, this year we, we're going to have a stab in the dark and give you X pounds and, um, you know, if we're wrong then we'll, we'll adjust it next year they actually said no if we're wrong we'll adjust it last year <laughs> so, and we'll have we'll have that back so it worked it worked very well the only people it didn't work well uh, well for were, were dentists who were sort of behind the finishing line when when the old shutters came down um you know it was like every year everyone started off on the same starting line and we all ran off and some of us ran faster than others and, and then what happened was the uh, race was f uh, the race was over, and the Department of Health put the finishing line down in the middle of the contestants, and everyone who was in front of the finishing line was like happy they 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 sort of won the rat race as it was called, and then everyone who was behind the line was a bit upset because uh, they uh, they got money claimed back for uh, that they hadn't actually earned because they hadn't seen enough patients. Anyway, shared savings. So, so think about that, really, because shared savings is what makes private sector profitable, and shared savings was what made the health sector, the dentistry, profitable. Till uh, these bloody UDAs came in. Now, the UDAs 
were thought to be a good idea and the government said look you know you guys for years you've been complaining that you don't know where the finishing line of this race is and and calling it a rat race and saying that you've all got to work as fast as you can because you don't know whether you're going to win the race or not because you don't know how fast everyone else is working and uh, of course now you know you've got a fixed contract you're 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 going to know to within a penny how much you're going to earn how much work you've got to do this is the certainty you've been whinging about you haven't had it for you know 40 years and you've been whinging about uncertainty and everything and so we're going to finally give you certainty and uh, and 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 it turned out that i think from the profession's point of view the rat race was actually better because now what, what people are doing is they're sitting back on their big fat superannuated contracts and saying, okay, right, how can we do as little as possible to earn the money? Now, <clears throat> I've arrived at work. I haven't got a big fat superannuated contract. And my first patient's not likely to turn up and my lead's not gonna come till later. So I'm gonna make myself a lovely cup of coffee, wish you a nice weekend and a happy St. Patrick's Day and on Monday I shall try and get my brain around how we can apply all this to coming up with a contract that will work for everybody, NHS included. Alright, have a nice weekend, bye.